begin by singing our, our uh, opening hymn, Blessed Jesus at Your Word. It's 221 in your hymnals. Uh, they are back in the pews, and uh, we're going to try to remember to uh, worship the way we used to. <laughs> I noticed last week when we did it, it was a little bit different because uh, we hadn't done it in a while. But uh, the hymn is also on the screen. Uh, we'll begin by singing that hymn. <laughs>
all that is good. Help us love you with all our heart. Strengthen us in true faith. Provide us with all we need. And keep us safe in your care. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. <laughs>
and listen to how the Lord responded to Paul. Therefore, to keep me from becoming arrogant due to the extraordinary nature of these revelations, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, so that I would not become arrogant. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that he would take it away from me. And he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, because my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will be glad to boast all the more in my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may shelter me. That is why I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties, for the sake of Christ. For whenever I am weak, then I am strong. This is the epistle of our Lord. Alleluia. Happy are they who hear the word, hold it fast in an honest and good heart, and bring forth fruit with patience. Alleluia. <coughs> Jesus asked them, 
to really look and see what is going on huh, with the miracles and to hear what is being said about him. This isn't normal. Huh? And yet how often don't we close our ears and close our eyes? Huh? Um, but we don't put Jesus out in the forefront with the miracles and that. We don't proclaim him as a savior. We don't, we don't listen in a sense as intently as we should. God asks us to open our ears and open our eyes so that we might see that Jesus is the Christ. And we would know him as our Savior and know that he died and rose for us. We pray. Many times in your word, Lord, you tell us that um, and pray that people would have ears that hear and eyes that see. Please let our ears hear and our eyes see that you are the Savior of the world, that you have died on the cross for all our sins, that you rose again to have power over death and the devil. May we see you as that Savior who has forgiven us, who loves us and wants to save us, and hear that message again and again of your love and grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We continue by singing the next day.
Christ who gave us the Lord's Prayer, the best prayer ever. Today we are discussing the fifth petition from Matthew 6, 12. Forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors. Grace, peace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. 1 Timothy 1, 2. Dear friends in Christ, how many of you have ever been in financial debt? Maybe it was a student loan that you had to repay. Maybe it was a car loan that you took out that you had to make monthly payments on. Maybe you borrowed $200 from a buddy. Debt has an interesting way of affecting us both emotionally and relationally. If you owed someone, uh, ever owed someone a personal debt, it gets even worse. If the one you loan the money from is not from a bank, but a person that you see regularly, it can have a tremendous effect. When uh, that person, uh, it, when it's a person, it gets personal. If a brother uh, who gave you $400 or the in-laws who loaned you $2,000 for the wedding and you promise to pay it back, it affects you. And when you meet them, you might say to yourself, I hope they don't bring up the debt because that would really be, uh, really be bad. That, that, that could be an awkward conversation. And that is what debt does. It has an effect. What is a thousand times worse is when that debt is not just monetary, but it's a morality thing. When someone owes you because of an offense they have done, it has the most profound effect that it has. When someone sins against you, they owe you something. You expected the day, the conversation, the marriage to go well and bring you joy. But if someone sins against you, then those moments of joy and the blessings that God intends you to give don't go so well. If someone sins against you, it's difficult not to hold a grudge. Not uh, difficult to have someone, uh, to love someone who has hurt you. And difficult even to forgive. Sometimes family members or former friends will simply smile and nod. And yet there's bitterness and um, tension in their heart. And sometimes they take revenge because of what he did. And sometimes they completely cut ties and they refuse to communicate at all. Sin is a debt and that debt always has an effect because of, that's what debts do. What is worse is when that debt is between us and God. Have you ever reached that point in your spiritual life that you can say, when you can't say with any conviction or honesty that you are a good person? You realize that you've taken a lot of honor from God and much of his glory and you haven't treated his children very well either. And that has a profound effect. And because of that, some people run away from God and from the church. And they don't want to talk about God in, to God in prayer. They, they don't want to open God's book and they don't want to uh, talk about their faith because what if God brought up the death? Well, that would be an awkward conversation, wouldn't it? And others stay in the church, but they live with this low-level guilt, always thinking that they owe God, that they have to pay Him back, and that they had better act better because of, the, of their past mistakes. Whether the debt is financial, moral, personal, or divine, whether, whenever there is a debt, it, leaves, it never leaves without having an effect. And that is why in the Lord's Prayer, the best prayer ever, Jesus teaches us how to deal with our debts, our sins, our trespasses. If there's a grudge in your heart or a grudge in your family, if people are taking revenge for far too long, if things are tense with someone at work, if there is friction between your relationship between you and God, today Jesus will teach us how to deal with our debts. And he starts with these words. Forgive us our debts. We could probably rattle off those five words in two seconds if we really wanted to. But we should probably spend about ten hours 
on them because every word is important. Don't worry, we're not going to do that today. <laughs> Debts are reminders that sin takes a, something from someone. The word forgive is important, but it doesn't mean forget. Who could possibly forget how deeply someone has hurt you? It doesn't mean to minimize, though, either and say, well, it's not a big deal. And it doesn't mean to justify and say, nobody's perfect. Forgive in the Bible means to send something away. Because of what you did, I will get you back. I will not love you or be cold to you. But with God, I am saying that I'm willing to cast that off. And I'm willing to forgive. I'm literally going to send it away so that I have no spiritual reason to do anything but love you. Sandwiched between those two important words are those two little words that we just mentioned. Us and our. Jesus is teaching all of us to pray the exact same prayer. And so whether you are a pastor, the Pope, the leader in a gay pride parade, a prostitute, or a Christian who prays every day, Jesus teaches us all the exact same prayer. There is not one prayer for good people, version of this prayer for good people, and then another version for bad people. There is just the prayer that Jesus taught all people to pray. And so if you walk into God's bank, every single one of us has to sit behind the desk of God in that bank, don't we? Well, take it another way. Imagine you walked into the first bank of the Holy Trinity where God is the president. And there he gives you a loan of $100 worth of morality. But at the end of the day, he wants that $100 back. And you say, well, that seems very simple. But the problem is between the time you leave the bank and the end of the day, and Satan, the great tempter, is selling sin for $5 each. When you walk out the front door of the bank and you make your first mistake, you decide to think, and thinking is dangerous. And you think about the next door neighbor who has a boat, and you don't have one. Or you think about the neighbor who has a new car with AC that actually works, and yours doesn't. So instead of giving thanks to God and praise Him for a thousand blessings, you buy a little jealousy and you're minus five dollars. You continue walking and you think about your sister who has gotten herself into a dramatic situation again. And even though you advised her how to fix it, she didn't listen. And she desperately needs your prayer. But you spend another five dollars for a quick thought of judgment and you rob her of the prayer that she so desperately needs. And so as you walk around the block and you look at your cell phone, you see a story about how much you should have saved for your retirement at this point in your life. And instead of trusting God who has provided for you a thousand days in the past and promises to provide for you a thousand days in the future, you start to worry. And you rob God of the honor that is due you. When you get into your car, you make the next big mistake. You drive through a reddish light, and that's another $5. You get to your office and the boss compliments you on a project well done. And instead of silently thanking God for your brain, your opportunities, your education, and your talent, you soak in the glory and you rob God of His. And by the end of the day, you have a whole $10 left. So you know it was a rough day spiritually, and as you pray, you say, God, I'm willing to make it up to you, I'm going to repay you. And that is when an angel appears in your bedroom, <laughs> looks at you and says, God is wondering how you're going to pay him back. And you say, well, tomorrow I'll go back to the bank, God's bank, and I have $10, and I'll get $100 more, so I'll have $110, and then I will pay him the $90, and uh, I, will, I, will use, I owe him $90, and I'll repay him. But the angel says, doesn't God want the next hundred dollars back too? And you see the problem, huh? Once you sin against God, how can you possibly pay him back? How can you pay off, I can pay off the credit card by making a little extra money. But how, if I have a moral debt, 
Can, you, can I live such a good life that it exceeds what God demands as a minimum payment? And then we hear about God's standards. Jesus said, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. And then later, love the Lord your God with all your heart. And then he says, love your neighbor as much as you love yourself. So how could I possibly do more than, uh, how could you possibly do more than that tomorrow? How could you expect to get extra so that you could repay God today? Luke said this, when you have done all that you were commanded, say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done what we were supposed to do. And once you sin, there is no human way to pay off that spiritual debt. Today, all of us need to accept this sad truth. You owed God. It doesn't matter how hard you've been trying, uh, how much you've been improving, how many prayers you have raised, how many offerings you have given. No matter who you are, whether you're good or bad, we must all accept God's truth that we owed God. How will that affect your relationship with God? Knowing that tomorrow, if you try ten times as hard, you will still fail, fall short, and owe God even more. How will that affect you? Will you give up? Will you say, well, what's the point? I'm never going to get enough to, to please God and, and, and attain His standard. Why would I try to fight temptation? Or will you naively leave, uh, live with the guilt and somehow try to repay God? To pay him back someday. What if you tried this instead? Pray, our Father in heaven, forgive us our debts. What if you prayed, Father, I can't make this up to you. I can't pay it back. Would you forgive me and send this away? If I place my hands on Jesus the scapegoat, would you take away every record of my sin and shred it at your bane, so that there is no record of my wrongs and I don't owe you any? That's the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. When he gave his life on the cross, he made sure that God would always answer yes. When we pray this petition, we always know what the answer is going to be. When we cry, forgive us our sins, we know that God is in his heart is going to forgive us. And we hear these beautiful words from Colossians. God, he raised, God made you alive with Christ by forgiving us all our trespasses. God erased the record of our debt brought against us by his legal demands. This record stood against us, but he took it away by nailing it to the cross. Circle that word, all. That's why it's bold there. Because every single one of them of our trespasses is gone. God made a record of our wrongs, but he erased it by nailing it to the cross. And here is the big, beautiful truth that God has declared at the cross a of his son again and again day after day to you and to me God declares you don't owe me the D at the end of the previous word was not a grammatical accident what we owed God was in the past but then Jesus gave his life so that through faith in his son you and I would not owe God anymore Jesus also gave us his riches and his wealth if your bank decided to cancel your mortgage so that you didn't owe any, any, anything, not even a penny, I bet you would call everyone and tell them the good news. But when Jesus forgave you, he didn't just cancel the debt. He made such a deposit that in your, in the, in your present and your future that you would never owe God again. If you are in Christ, and if you are one of his children, then there is nothing that you will do today that at the end of the day, that God will say to you, well, now you owe me. Not today, not tomorrow, not next year, never. God will never say that. No matter how scandalous or how repetitive the sin, you are so rich in Jesus Christ that you will never owe him again. And yet, naturally, we think that we owe God. Even if I confess my sins yesterday, I still think that I know God today, right? And that's why Jesus taught us in this prayer to forgive us our debts every day. And Jesus stretched out his arms on the cross to make sure that God's answer to us would always be yes. But Jesus isn't done. We could have left here rejoicing 
with our sins forgiven, but Jesus says also in this petition, as we also forgive our debtors. Let me ask you a very difficult question. Who are your debtors? Who has sinned against you? Who owes you a debt that they could not repay? Who took something from you that you can never get back? Was it your father with his beer or his fists? Did he take a childhood from you that you can't, you can't possibly return? Is it a mother who's overbearing, arrogant, desire to always be right? That means that now even in your 20s, she is still trying to impose her will on you and her family? Is it an ex that took away that happily ever after and put you through emotional hell by the way he treated you or the things she said to you? Is it someone at work that's very critical? Or is it a pastor who wasn't there for you when you needed him the most? Who are your debtors? Most importantly, how will you deal with it? I don't know whose faces that are coming to your mind right now, but I do know this. It is tempting to keep those debts right here, to hold a grudge in your heart that lasts for years, to tell the same old story that you've been telling for years about the way he treated you or what she said to you. And it's so difficult to forgive. But on the other hand, to not forgive is dumb. Besides being God's will, what is, the, what is the point of it? What are you going to get out of it by holding a grudge? And that's what Jesus taught us in this petition. Forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors. Oh, we could refuse to forgive him or her. We could say, we could saw off that branch that's called forgiveness so that the sinner comes crashing down with a thud. But then remember that we too sit on that branch. And we would come crashing down too. No? These words are not so much a statement of fact as a cry of our heart. We don't want to pay people back. We want to forgive as Jesus did. To forgive those who don't deserve it as Jesus did from the cross. So the question we have to wrestle with is how? How do you possibly do that? How do we possibly love someone who deserves it the least? How do you, if you struggle with a, a grudge, it is and it's difficult to love, look up and see the caring face of the Father who has forgiven you every debt, day after day. Jesus teaches us that our canceled debts compel us to cancel theirs. We must never lose the sight of the lose sight of what has been forgiven, so that we have the power to forgive others. And that is what Jonathan knew. When he took his family to the Trestle Trail Bridge in Menasha, that's in Wisconsin, Jonathan Staple could not have known it was the last day of his life. But it happened. The shots rang out and the bullets left an unspeakable death. The killer had taken the communi a community of its peace, a woman of her husband and a family of their father, and as it was a debt that the killer could never repay. As Jonathan lay there bleeding, he spoke his final words to his wife, and they, they were about forgiveness. But why did he speak to them? The family released a statement to the media that said this. Jonathan's last words were, forgive the shooter, period. How do you forgive someone who's killing you? Only when you remember that you were forgiven by the one that you killed. How can you speak words of forgiveness to one who has an unspeakable debt? You look at the Father's face and you hear him say these words, You don't owe me. And that's how you deal with the effect of death, of death, and that's why the Lord's Prayer is the best prayer ever. Amen. Please rise and we'll say together the Apostles' Creed that's found on page 41 in the front of your temple and on the screen. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose.
you for the offer. Please rise for prayer. I say the prayer of the church that are responsible for the icon of page 42. Included in our prayers this morning are prayers for Pastor James Bartz's family. Uh, the Lord called Pastor Bartz home uh, to his eternal home in heaven. Uh, and uh, also for Laura Gallery's uh, knee surgery or knee replacement surgery uh, this, uh, that she will have this week. Lord God, our maker and preserver, we praise and thank you for all that you give us day after day. We are not worthy in all the mercies you show us. You have given us your precious word to nourish our souls and to protect us from the temptations of the devil, the world, and our sinful nature. We thank you for those who teach and preach your saving truth at this place and everywhere. Grant them a rich measure of patience, wisdom, and love. Heavenly Father, we pray that you shield us from every kind of danger, sudden catastrophe, terrors of crime, and the pain of disease. Watch over those who travel by land, sea, and air. Keep our loved ones from whatever perils may threaten them. Heal those who are sick. Cheer those who are sad. Calm those who are distressed. And comfort all who are old and infirm. Bless our land, our people, and those who hold offices of high trust. Keep our government and schools upright and strong for the advancement of good citizenship and useful vocations, that we may enjoy your gifts of peace, security, and well-being. Grant your blessings to every nation on earth. Where there are wars, may there be peace. Where there is hatred, let it be healed. Where there is poverty, danger, or disaster, come with your almighty Jesus, head of the church and chief chief shepherd of your flock, and is pleased to call uh, Pastor James Bartz uh, from this earthly life to heavenly glory. While we mourn his death, we rejoice in the eternal victory he now shares with you. We thank you for the blessings that you bestowed on Pastor Bartz, for bringing him to faith, and for preserving him in faith, and for the joy. Uh, and for giving him the joy of publicly proclaiming your word and administering your sacraments. You have kept him faithful to your word and made him a blessing to uh, many others. Grant a special, a special measure of comfort to his family as they mourn his loss and give healing to their sorrowing hearts through the precious assurance of your word. May the death of Pastor Bartz remind us all of the frailty of life and may the Holy Spirit ever keep before us the goal of everlasting life. Dear Lord Jesus, we also pray that to you who are the great physician of body and soul, and therefore we place our beloved sister, Lord Galloway, into your tender care, trusting both your power and your grace to save. Give the necessary skills to the surgeon and bless their work. If it be your will, watch at all times so that no harm accidentally comes to our loved one. Through the wound the surgeon must make, 
the may you grant the blessing of your healing hand. If her confinement uh, should uh, provide to be a trial, then give her the strength to bear it, and grant that all apprehensions and discomforts may soon be replaced with joy. Dear Heavenly Father, we also pray for uh, Tyler Webb as he continues uh, to um, pursue his military service in this country. Uh, watch over him with your fatherly love and send holy angels to guard and protect him. Encourage him not to neglect his uh, uh, duties, but when in the company of the others, maybe he, may he be an example of behavior uh, to them. May your blessed promise to forgive all sins and to grant eternal life through Christ uh, be his, uh, and uh, that he would uh, fill his heart with joy and strengthen his faith in every trial. In the name of our Savior Jesus Christ, we ask you. Hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. We bring these requests before you in the name of Jesus our Lord and ask you to hear us. Take all that we have, our bodies and minds, our time and skills, our ministries and offerings, and use them to your glory. We give ourselves to you, that we may serve you in whatever way is pleasing in your sight. Amen. We pray the Lord's Prayer. Our God, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses.
delivered us in all temptation, and bestow on us your saving peace. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Brothers and sisters, go in peace, live in harmony with one another, serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you peace. Uh, and know that uh, as the Lord forgives us, then we forgive. 